All right, Bismillah rahman rahim Thank you, everybody, who's joining us from home and who are present here as well. Um, today, we'll be giving a Know Your Rights uh, presentation, um, school bullying, what to know, how to empower yourself, how to protect yourself, and um, that will be my portion of the presentation. And then after that, uh, my colleague Jeffrey Wang will be giving uh, his presentation in regards to uh, your rights uh, in the employment. Who we are, or what we do, we do civic engagement, legal services, media, outreach and education, uh, youth empowerment through many programs that we do throughout the year at CARE. Our mission is to enhance understanding of Islam, protect civil rights, promote justice and empower American Muslims. And just a quick disclaimer for everyone, uh, the material covered in this presentation is intended only to educate and does not constitute legal advice. Uh, viewers should not act on the information provided without seeking professional legal counsel first. And uh, you may seek legal counsel on your own or you may uh, um, contact CARE. We also have legal consultations that we can provide to the community to help you understand and know your rights uh, depending on the situation. Okay, so what is school bullying? Um, it's, we define it as a hurtful behavior that is unwanted, aggressive, and repeated. Uh, when a student causes another student to feel less safe, feel fearful, or unable to participate in school. So it could be anything that's engendering religion, your gender, race, ethnicity, natural origin. Uh, the problems that we, uh, Muslims students face um, that we see or identify in care, uh, complaints that now come to us, uh, we have seen the pulling of headscarves or, or kofiyas off of uh, brothers and sisters in the community, uh, pressure to convert to another religion, and insulting comments about Islam made in the classroom, um, usually by the teacher uh, giving instruction and giving information that's not exactly accurate, and at times uh, we find uh, uh, very hurtful to those students that are s sitting in the classroom. And of course, physical abuse. Can adults be bullies too? Yes, they can. Um, being bullied and comes in many different forms and the perpetrators are not just one group, it could be anyone. Um, some of those students have reported that teachers treat them differently based on their faith or their country of origin. Um, so like I said, uh, bullies can be um, their fellow students, or it could be teachers, administrative staff, it could be anyone. Uh, if a teacher makes a false statement about Islam, you know, this is being addressed to our students who are watching now, you should feel empowered uh, and know that you can respectfully raise your hand and, and um, Raise the issue during class if you find something uh, factually incorrect uh, regarding your culture, religion, or perhaps um, any comments made to, to your dress if you are a visibly uh, Muslim student. Um, if there are following situ if the, any of the following situations occur, report, report it to the principal. <clears throat> um, a teacher prohibits or punishes you for wearing your, your hijab or poofy. So this is something you should report to the principal or somebody above your teacher. If you don't feel comfortable doing that, by all means, again, still report it to your parents and your parents may speak or advocate on your behalf. Um, and then, of course, if a teacher makes fun of your name, country of origin, religion, even in a joking way, this is considered bullying and this is unacceptable behavior and this should also be reported. Um, don't let it go, go without being addressed either by your parents or going directly to school officials. And last, if a teacher suggests that you should convert to a different religion. Uh, types of bullying. So there are several types, uh, student to student, peer bullying, uh, teacher to student, uh, administrators, principals, or other school staff can also be perpetrators of uh, bullying. And the curriculum content, that very content that the that you're learning in class. It might be a chapter on Islam, might be a chapter on the country that you come from. Um, if it's offensive, if it's outright racist, or makes you feel uncomfortable in any way, 
you again you are allowed to raise uh, the, the question with the teacher without disrupting class you can talk to the teacher after class you can raise the issue with school administrators again if you don't feel comfortable doing any of those things uh, by all means discuss what was what instruction was provided in class the lesson plan discuss it with your parents and then they again they can on your behalf go and address the issue uh, with the school uh, what does bullying look like like we've already said it, it, there's uh, physical bullying and of course it can be verbal um, words that are spoken uh, and social and we'll get into those a little more in depth uh, momentarily so like with physical, it's the hitting, pushing, kicking, uh, shoving, spitting, pulling people's clothing, uh, destroying or stealing somebody's property. In the verbal, it can be name calling, te uh, teasing, insults, saying mean things, telling people's secrets, uh, threatening others. And the social aspect of it is ignoring people. Perhaps teachers are ignoring you uh, outright uh, from participating in classroom projects. Um, leaving people out on purpose, telling other people not to be somebody's friend, uh, embarrassing somebody in public, gossiping, spreading rumors. So bullying, in a traditional sense, one might think it's something that might be verbal, physical, but it has many different uh, branches that come out of bullying. And we want to make sure that everybody understands that it's, it's a very big problem and it can come and manifest itself in many different ways. And you should never feel that um, it's not serious enough to address. Again, um, you know, these things I've mentioned are real and they will affect your mental health and they'll affect your, your ability to have a decent education. So by all means, um, feel empowered to discuss it with your parents, a friend, or school administ administrative staff if that's a viable option for you. Uh, what, are, what about cyberbullying? Uh, bullying that takes place online and over digital devices. So examples of sending mean or hateful messages to somebody, uh, posting hateful messages on social media about someone, or you know, or maybe you might be the victim of those uh, messages, uh, sharing someone else's personal, private information online. Again, this is a this is also a, another branch of bullying. It's because of the new world we live in. This is the cyber bullying that I'm sure everybody is heard of and hopefully nobody's been victim to it but it's it's there it's a real thing and again please address these things because uh, you should not be subjected to this type of behavior uh, impact of bullying and I mean it, it, to me there's a lot of information on this slide but the, the most important thing to understand that, um, that bullying will affect your ability to learn whether you think you, what has been happening to you is a big deal or not. It affects your ability mentally to perform well in school. It affects your ability to eventually socialize and make friends, uh, your ability to think, your health, and and at the end, um, other problems may arise from this if you are not able to address it appropriately. So the ramifications of not addressing bullying are many and you know, we, we want you to understand that you should feel empowered always, always to understand that you deserve the best education and that you should feel proud uh, of who you are and that any, nobody, whether it's a teacher, administrator, or student, should ever you know, um, insult who you are, whether jokingly or not, and that this is not tolerable. Um, this is not tolerated. So, again, the effects of bullying, uh, which have been proved scientifically, uh, but you know, and also by our own work at CARE, we've seen what happens when individuals go on through the education process without resolving issues. So we just want you to feel empowered. We want you to understand that there are people who can, who will listen and who will help. And last but not least, I know I've said speak to your parents, speak to a friend or a school administrator if possible, but of course reach out to CARE as well. Uh, CARE is here to help and represent our, our, our Muslim brothers and sisters in the community. And there are other organizations as well. Reach out to your mosque. Uh, there, I, there, so don't ever feel alone. There are a multitude of opportunities uh, for people to, uh, to listen to you and to address any situation that you may be going through. Um, and with that, I will 
turn it over to uh, my colleague, Jeffrey Wang. All right. Thank you, Riyadh. Um, so that was a very quick you know, introduction about uh, school bullying. We're going to switch gears a little bit now and talk about what your rights are in the workplace. Um, as Riyadh mentioned, uh, we are CARE. We're the nation's largest American Muslim civil rights and advocacy organization. And we provide direct legal services for Muslims who face discrimination in a variety of settings. We also provide um, our immigration attorneys also help people who are seeking help trying to become a citizen, trying to seek asylum, all those things. We'll have contact information at the end of the presentation. Again, quick disclaimer. Um, even though we are a legal organization, the information that we're presenting and sharing today is for general informational purposes only. Uh, we would recommend seeking the advice of attorneys first before taking any action on anything you may you think you may need help with. And very quickly, in terms of the topics I'll be talking about today, um, first is what is employment discrimination and how do we handle it, how do we deal with it? Then we're going to talk about uh, religious accommodations. How do you get what they are? How do you get them? Just some good practical tips. And finally, um, for those who are attending in person, we'll have some opportunity for a brief Q&A. Unfortunately, that part will not be covered by the live stream. So first, um, when we're talking about employment discrimination and what it is, um, what we're really talking about, discrimination means being treated differently or unfairly. And in the employment context, employment discrimination is when an employee or job applicant is treated differently or less favorably because of what we call a protected characteristic. Okay, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but you can basically see on the slide, protected characteristics are traits that are that really people can't really change. Race, national origin, uh, your faith, gender, things like that, right? They're re really central to who people are. And the law recognizes that because they are so central to people's identities, they need to be respected and protected, okay? Uh, employment discrimination is prohibited. It's outlawed in any aspect of the employment relationship. And that applies to the hiring process too. So you don't have to wait until you become an employee or a worker to get the benefits of these anti-discrimination laws. They also apply if you are seeking a job. Um, there's many different types of discrimination claims depending on what specifically happens to an employee or job applicant. Uh, just to give some examples, some examples of unlawful discrimination could, could include, for example, if an employer pays female employees less than their male colleagues uh, for doing the same type of work, that's employment discrimination. If, a, if an employer, if a company lays off all their workers over a certain age, right, and only keeps their younger workers, that could be employment discrimination. If a company denies promotions and uh, to all employees, all workers of a, of a certain racial background, or if a company, if an employer refuses to provide reasonable accommodations, whether it's for someone's physical disabilities or maybe because they have some religious beliefs. These are all examples of employment discrimination. Now, I gave you like four examples just now because this topic is so broad. Um, the main types of dis discrimination we'll be focusing today on to provide more information about are harassment, hostile work environment, and then issues related to getting accommodations. Um, and then finally, I have on the slides, um, there's also something called retaliation. And the general idea is if someone complains about discrimination or harassment, um, and then they assist with an investigation or a lawsuit, um, and then they suffer some adverse consequences, that is also an example of employment discrimination. Now, one thing to know, uh, you might be wondering, like, okay, what's, what's protecting me um, from employment discrimination? There is no one single source of employment discrimination laws. It's a mix of a lot of federal, so nationwide, 
statewide and local laws that combine to provide protections for workers. Um, unfortunately, some laws only prohibit discrimination that are based on very specific categories. So that means that not every form of discrimi like discriminatory or unfair treatment might be illegal under the, under the law. And I'll talk about, I'll highlight some of the differences between these laws. Um, on the slides, you'll see the first one highlighting the main federal law that provides, that prohibits employment discrimination. It's called Title VII. That's a federal law. It applies across the country. Um, Title VII pro prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. Um, just, those cate just those categories. You'll notice I didn't say things like um, disability, right? Disability is covered by the uh, Americans with Disability Act. There's the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, which prohibits discrimination generally against people who are 40 years of age or older. Now, state laws, um, in many cases, California laws offer broader anti-discrimination protections than the federal laws I just talked about. For example, in California, we have what's called the Fair Employment and Housing Act, and that's California's main anti-discrimination law. That, in addition to all the categories I mentioned for um, Title VII, like race, color, religion, sex, and national origin, the Fair Employment and Housing Act here in California also covers things like sexual orientation, pregnancy, certain medical conditions like uh, cancers, things like that. So it provides a lot more coverage and a lot more um, protections. There's also the California Labor Code, which provides even more protections. For example, people who take time off for jury duty, that is protected under the California Labor Code. Your employer cannot punish you because you've been summoned for jury duty and you go report to, uh, to jury duty. Uh, California Labor Code also provides protections um, for employees to uh, try, like engage in certain kinds of speech, uh, including certain kinds of political speech too. And that's something I'll talk about a little late, later. Now finally, just kind of like further complicate things a little more, there are also some local laws that sometimes even offer even greater protections that address even more types of potential discrimination or protected characteristics that you know all the laws above uh, that I mentioned don't actually cover. I'll give you one example. Um, San Francisco, I believe, they also prohibit discrimination that's based on a job a job applicant or worker's height and weight. So another, more protected classes to consider too. Um, you know, together, all these laws not only prohibit discrimination, but they also require employers to prevent discrimination and harassment that's happening because of these protected characteristics. So what that really means is once employers are aware or if they should have knowledge that discrimination or harassment is occurring in the workplace, they have a duty to stop that kind of behavior and to prevent the future discriminatory acts. Um, these laws are also the laws that uh, ensure that employers have to um, try to honor or work with employees to figure out uh, accommodation requests. And I'll be talking a little bit more about this in the uh, later section. Now, federal and state laws, all these laws I just talked about, make it illegal for employers to discriminate. And also, you know, it's the employer's duty to prevent harassment from occurring. But note one thing, um, these laws, a lot of these laws only apply if the employer has a certain numerical amount, like a minimum number of employees. And hopefully you can see the slide um, if you're attending virtually. But so what, what does this mean? Um, let's take, for example, I mentioned Title VII, the, the main federal law. Title VII applies to employers who have 15 or more employees, right? Um, so, and, you know, conversely, I talked about how a lot of state laws, like California's Federal uh, Fair Employment and Housing Act, are more protective, are broader. So compare that with uh, the Fair Employment and Housing Act, which is about halfway down the table. That applies if an employer has at least five employees. So you see there's a difference there. If maybe there's an employer that has 12 employees, they might not um, fall under the coverage of Title VII. But if they're based in California, they will have more than five. So the Fair Employment and Housing Act will apply. Something to keep, to keep in mind, too. So 
when we're talking about, I mentioned we're going to be talking about harassment. That's one of the um, quintessential, that's one of the, um, you know, most common types of employment discrimination. Um, when we're talking about harassment, uh, what we're really talking about is uh, un unlawful and unwelcome conduct that is directed at an individual based on their protected characteristics or status. Now, you may have heard of the term hostile work environment before. That's really, you can think of it as, you know, workplace bullying. It's a type of harassment, but um, it has to reach a certain level, right, to become a hostile work environment. What we're really talking about is unwelcome behavior that becomes so severe or pervasive that creates an intimidating, offensive, or abusive work environment that makes it more difficult, that makes it harder for an employee to do his or her job. Like if a reasonable person were put into that same situation, they would find it more difficult to do that job. And, you know, harassment can come from both supervisors as well as colleagues and coworkers, and sometimes can even come from uh, like, you know, clients, customers, or contractors. It really doesn't matter what the source is. Your employer has a duty to protect protect you to protect employees from harassment regardless of the source but it's really important that they become aware of it and how do you do that you have to report it and I'll get to that later in the presentation now whether uh, or not a hostile work environment if someone is getting constantly harassed if someone is facing a lot of repeated harassment at work right like does that would that become a hostile work environment? The answer is it probably depends. Whether a hostile work environment depends or exists is kind of fact specific. You, we take it case by case. We have to look at each individual circumstance, right? And um, we have look at several factors. Generally, we will con like courts will look at the severity and the frequency and the context of the conduct. Now, sometimes at one single incident might be enough to create a hostile work environment. But generally, um, if we're talking about like isolated minor incidents, those might not usually be sufficient. Um, you can kind of think of it as almost like a sliding scale, right? The less frequently, the less number of occurrences there are, the more severe um, that, you know, offending conduct that harassment has to be, right? And I mean, but regardless, Examples of harassment, and especially if done repeatedly, like harassing conduct, could include inappropriate jokes, derogatory comments or slurs, suggestive comments, um, verbal threats, and of course, actual physical harassment or abuse, too. So, what do you do if you've been harassed at work, right, or are facing behavior that makes you uncomfortable? Whether or not you think, you know, if you're not a lawyer, like, don't I wouldn't try to like you know figure out oh do I have a hostile work environment or not no if you're in doubt right seek legal help that's what we can do at care we can provide consultations or advice right but the bottom line if you're facing behavior that's making you uncomfortable or unsafe at work and it's also affecting you like so much where you're unable to work what are some steps you can take right regardless of what form of conduct that's looking like first thing that we always tell people is to document the incidents you really want to get down, like, note times, dates, witnesses, what's happening, right? And when I'm talking, when we're saying document, um, we would suggest, if you can, keep a written record or a journal of what's happening, right? And maybe keep it at home. Don't try to do it on the company's, like, equipment, like a company-issued laptop or your company, you know, your, if you're sending out things to your supervisors or whatever, um, you know, try to keep a log of who you contacted when to report the harassment to. And the reason why we would suggest keeping a written record or something separate at home is, you know, if something happens and your employment is affected, what I mean by that is maybe like you're suspended for reporting harassment or maybe trying, uh, you get fired, right? You could lose access to all those records if you had it on your uh, company's equipment. So keep a separate journal, keep a log of what's happening at home. The more evidence, um, the more evidence that people like prospective clients come to us with, the, easy, the easier it is to potentially be able to show or prove a discrimination or hostile work environment claim down the road. And oftentimes that can turn on how much evidence you have too. 
once you've documented things, um, it's a good idea to review your employer's handbook or policy for how to report things. How do you, uh, what are the grievance procedures like, right? You want to review any kind of policies that might be, uh, that could be relevant. And then you want to make your employer aware. Remember I said the employer has a duty to prevent harassment and or discrimination, right? But that duty, you have to make them aware that something's going on. Um, and that's why you want to try to review the any kind of handbook or any kind of policy first, because that might tell you who do you report to. You know, is it to HR? Is it to your direct supervisor? Right. And sometimes there may be layers in place. If you know, if it's not possible to report to your supervisor because your supervisor is a harasser, there may be someone else you could report to. Um, and you want to try to follow that to the best of your ability and to the fullest extent practical. Right. If you're going to complain, if you're going to do a report in person, it's always a good practical tip. Follow up any written complaint, any meeting you have um, with, you know, some sort of written correspondence and make sure you keep a copy for yourself too. It could be some, something as simple as just, you know, um, after a meeting, like making sure everyone's on the same page. Here's we, what we talked about today. Here's my understanding of, you know, what you all said you would, you know, either do or look into. Here's my understanding of the timeline. Can you confirm something like that, right? You want to be, do this so that there's a record and also so maybe the employer can't later on say they weren't aware there was a problem, right? They weren't aware there was discrimination or harassment going on, right? And of course, try to keep copies of your, the, this correspondence that you're that you're having with your employer. Um, it says okay, and then sometimes your employer might ask you to sign something either before, during, or after investigation, um, just as a matter of like just general legal advice, we would not advise someone to sign something if they're unsure what it is without checking with the lawyer first. This is definitely true in this case. If you're not sure what it is you are being asked to sign, um, ask for some time to look it over to discuss it with the lawyer first, right? Don't sign anything without first seeking legal advice. Then, um, you know, finally, depending on what happens, depending on how your employer handles things or maybe doesn't, Consider your options and, you know, it could be several options. If you are in a workplace that has a union, right, talk with a union rep if you have one. See what your options are maybe there. Um, your options maybe are legal options. If your employer hasn't, if you've complained, right, maybe more than once. If your employer hasn't done enough to address the issue, maybe then it's time to escalate. Um, and that could mean filing some sort of complaint with either a federal or a state agency that's in charge of, uh, responsible for overseeing these anti-discrimination laws. You can get help throughout this process. You can come to CARE, you can seek other legal um, organizations, there's employment attorneys, um, but if in doubt, you're always welcome to reach out to CARE. All right, switching gears a little bit, we're gonna talk about religious accommodations. What it is, what those are, uh, how do you get one? So when we're talking about religious accommodations, um, generally we're talking about how employers have an obligation to provide a reasonable accommodation for an employee's sincere religious belief that that is in conflict with an employer's job requirement. Um, and so employers have an obligation to kind of engage in a dialogue and to potentially provide some sort of uh, accommodation unless doing so would cause the employer undue hardship. Now there's some terms in here that are italicized, are in bold. I'll break these down a little more. Some examples though, and maybe this is familiar to the audience here already, but the most common religious accommodation request that we usually assist um, folks with usually center around either the hours of work, um, aka being asking for time off to attend Juma prayers on Fridays or for time around Eid or Ramadan, um, or for like accommodations to dress codes. Um, or maybe we're talking about like um, there's a uniform requirement for a particular job and requesting accommodation to be able to dress modestly or for male employees to be able to wear a beard, right? These are the most common religious accommodation requests we are usually assisting people with um, here at CARE. 
So uh, when we're talking about accommodation, like what are accommodations? Uh, so accommodation really is just a change in a workplace policy that lets you engage in your uh, religious practice or observance at work while you still perform the essential functions of your job. Okay. Um, there's a couple of things to keep in mind, though. Um, employers are not required to provide the exact or preferred accommodation that you request. And what I mean is, I'll just use a little more extreme example, a little more extreme hypothetical example. Um, let's say someone wants to, uh, you know, attend Jummah prayer at their favorite mosque, which is maybe half an hour away from their workplace. So instead of asking for just a couple of hours off on Friday, they decide to ask for like six hours off on Fridays. Um, and maybe this employer, maybe there's a mosque that's actually maybe just five minutes away from that job site. And so this employee, he, he has asked for, you know, let's say six hours off basically in the entire day. Um, Will the employer grant that depending on, you know, how many people are, you know, how many other people are working on Fridays, depending on what the job is, maybe, maybe not, right? But again, the employer is not required to provide the exact or preferred accommodation. Maybe the employer can ask, okay, why do you need this many hours off? Okay, because you, you know, want to attend Juma prayer, which is usually middays. Is there anything closer? I can maybe let you go for three hours, right? Somewhere that's three hours, you know. He, that employee might not get that original accommodation request where he asked for six hours. Um, and the employer would not be required to provide that exact or preferred accommodation. Whether accommodation is reasonable um, or not, and or can be granted or not, will depend on several factors. Uh, before we get into what all those factors are, though, um, you know, when we're talking about religious accommodations and like, you know, what kind of religious beliefs can be accommodated for, the law is actually really broad. It covers all aspects of religious observances. So I mentioned earlier religious dress, so modest dress requirements, grooming practices, um, attending worship services, so like Juma prayer, or also refraining from certain activities. Um, if, you know, someone doesn't want to serve, has like if there's any kind of like prohibition against uh, alcohol, if someone doesn't want to serve alcohol, right, that could be a religious accommodation that is asked, that is requested as well. Now, um, employers are not required to grant accommodations uh, under the law if the accommodation would cause them undue hardship. Now, the law actually changed in 2023. Um, there's a slight difference between federal and California law. Now, the federal, under the federal laws, um, the employer has to show that granting the accommodation would cause them to incur substantial expenses. Whereas in California, um, the employer would have to show that, you know, granting accommodation would cause them significant difficulty or expense. Um, but the general idea is the same. So an employer is not required to grant an accommodation if it can show that the accommodation, that if it grants it, it would lead to more costs, more difficulties for the employer. But whether or not, you know, that kind of, like whether or not something would lead to like increased hardship, like would not be practical or feasible to do, would depend on the nature of the workplace, right? Um, the type of, and also the type of accommodation that's being requested. So we, you really have to consider things like what specifically is the uh, worker, is the employee asking for, right? Um, what is it something, maybe it's a dress code, um, like a modification to the dress code. Even then though, there would be differences between maybe asking to, you know, um, be able to dress modestly versus if say a firefighter has a really long beard, um, there might be some like, asking for a dress code uh, modification for maybe say a retail job versus a firefighter with a really long beard, the firefighter, like the fire department might not be as amenable as willing to accommodate because, well, if you're talking about dealing with fires and you need to be able to keep a mask on for certain things, there's some dangers there, right? So 
It really depends on the specific accommodation being asked for and the nature of the job. Some other type of factors are, you know, what kind of setting is the job being done in, right? In a hospital setting, and we saw this during COVID, um, there was a lot of back and forth about, okay, like, how do we accommodate uh, people who have beards, but also still need to wear PPE, right? So it depends on a lot of factors. These are case by case. If you have difficulties though, speak with the attorney, get some legal help, get a consult. So some, some of the things that could um, cause undue hardships though also are things that might decrease workplace efficiency. So if an employer, like if we're talking about um, employers trying to say, okay, if I were to grant this accommodation, this will lead to an undue hardship. What are some of these reasons? Uh, we could, could be talking about things that could, if they decrease workplace efficiency. If something infringes on the rights of the other employees, or if it impairs workplace safety, right? I talked about firefighters and beards, sometimes lab technicians, if you're working with biohazardous materials too, similar concept. If whatever you're asking for, uh, and that accommodations granted could affect the workplace safety, that could be an undue hardship too. And the employer would probably not have to grant that accommodation. How does it work? Um, so when an employee, uh, and you know, since we're here at CARE, uh, we help Muslims who face discrimination or difficulties in the workplace, we're only focusing about religious, religious accommodations today not really talking about physical accommodations. Um, those certainly are a thing too. Um, but we're talking about it from the frame of requesting religious accommodations. Um, so when an employee, when a worker has a sincerely held religious belief, and that is in conflict with the job duty, when that employee makes his or her employer aware of that conflict, the employer is then supposed to engage the, the worker in a good faith negotiation. Right. Um, the employer's duty under the law is to engage in this kind of dialogue and then if practic practicable to try to provide a reasonable accommodation. Again, not the exact accommodation that was requested. So what that means is the employee, the employee should do their best to work with the employer to, you know, if an employer asks you after you've made this request, okay, like, you know, tell me more about what it is you're seeking and maybe could we meet halfway or something, right? Engage them in that dialogue. If your employer like, you know, wants to try to help you like be able to like meet you halfway, don't just stonewall them. Don't just ignore any kind of questions they might have about, okay, you know, tell me more about, you know, what it is you're seeking, right? If you need time off to attend Juma, like, you know, how, how much time do you need off? Like, don't just, don't just ignore them because answering those questions about the logistics or things like that could help you get that uh, accommodation. Now, there's no, and really engaging and engaging that dialogue is what I call, is what we call engaging in the interactive process, right? Um, it's really important that, again, it's an interactive process. That means there's a back and forth. Once you've made that accommodation, like, you want to answer your employer's questions about like any follow-up questions about what it is you're seeking. Don't just ignore them. It's an interactive process. Now, there are no magic words, quote unquote, magic words required. You don't have to specifically say, I am requesting a reasonable accommodation. Um, although, I mean, it, it doesn't hurt to, but you're not required to specifically use those words. Okay. The bottom line is make your employer aware, right? Um, it's important that they're made aware of the need for accommodation. And even though there's no specific words required, still don't be vague about the request, right? If you need time off for Juma prayer, it doesn't hurt to be specific, right? You, you need time off to attend prayer. It's part of your sincerely held belief. And, you know, don't keep your employer guessing about like what day it is, like how many hours you need off, right? If you can say with any specificity to help your employer help you, Right? Don't just be like, oh, I need to take off Friday, you know, Friday around noon. Your employer might be thinking, what does around noon mean? How many hours will you be gone? Right. So don't be vague. Um, some other general good practical 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 tips. Um, don't wait until the last minute before an accommodation is needed. Like it's always a good idea to inform them and ask as early as possible. Um, 
similar to kind of the tips for reporting discrimination and harassment earlier, it's always a good idea to first familiarize yourself with the procedures that you know your employer might have, review the handbook, review the policies, right? And then make that request. If again, if you're doing this in person and if you're doing it verbally, never a bad idea to follow up with writing, right? Just so there's a just so there's a record of it too, right? Um, and keep in mind, it's the uh, the law says that the employers have a duty to engage in the interactive process. So it's important that you continue to, you know, follow up. If your employer has any questions, right, engage them in that dialogue to help them help you. Just a quick recap here. Uh, make your accommodations requests in writing and as early as possible. Um, while no magic words are required, you should make clear you're requesting accommodation because of your sincere religious belief. And then always just document and keep a personal record of, you know, when your, re when your request was made, who you made it to, things like that. And then if your employer grants a request, great. If they have follow-up questions, engage in that dialogue with them. Very quickly, I'm going to talk very quickly about retaliation a little bit. I mentioned this earlier. This is yet another form of employment discrimination, just something to keep an eye out for. It is illegal for employers to punish employees. Uh, when I say punish, we're really talking about taking what's called adverse employment action. Then that could mean anything as severe as termination or demotion or suspension. It can also mean um, like being excluded from like meetings they were they, uh, the worker may have used to be a part of, or a sudden huge increased workload, um, or just getting negative reviews for no other ostensible reason. So um, it's illegal to for employers to take adverse employment action against an employee or treat them in a discriminatory way because that employee has engaged in what the law calls protected activity. You'll see on the slide, there's three examples of protected activity on there, but the idea is if you take steps, if you think discrimination is happening in your workplace, whether it's happening to yourself or maybe to someone else, and you take steps to report that discrimination or harassment, your employer cannot take adverse action, cannot retaliate, cannot punish you for doing that, for reporting um, these sort of like unlawful activities or discriminated, discrimination or harassment. And also, uh, your employer cannot retaliate, cannot punish against you for requesting reasonable accommodations for disability or religion. Again, if you've been retaliated against, same steps to take as earlier. Document everything, review what the employer's policies, procedures are, make your complaint, right? Um, keep copies of everything. If you're being given something assigned and you don't know what it is, always a better idea to check with the lawyer first and then get legal help, look at what your options are. And that concludes <clears throat> our prepared part of the presentation for today. Um, we do have time for Q&A, and so this will uh, conclude, I believe, the live stream part of it because for QA, um, we will not be, it's for in-person only, and we're not, I think, live streaming the questions.